Hello and welcome to the PPW pod. My name is Edmund Keith. I'm the editor of OnlineMarketplaces.com. I'm joined today by Simon Baker. Simon, how are you doing? Ed, I'm great. I'm uh, enjoying having the gardeners out the front, but that's cool. And, and how are you? Been your back from yeah. uh, baby leave? Yeah, if there's baby noises in the background for this one, uh, we apologize. Um, this was kind of a, an episode that we had planned from a while ago. Basically, I realized that I've been doing this now for four years. I've been reading about, writing about, collecting data on real estate portals for four years. I've interviewed dozens of portal CEOs. I've collected hundreds and thousands, hundreds of thousands of data points. I've written more words about real estate portals than, than, you know, that are in the Bible at this point. And I still have no idea how I would run one of these businesses. It still seems hard to me. Yep. Luckily, I have you, someone who's been there, who's done that and then spent I don't know, 15 years uh, thinking about it and writing about it and having conferences 25, about it. 25. 25. 25 years this year. Well, technically okay. next year. Okay. So, well, I mean, there's your credentials. If anyone wants to see more of your credentials, um, just look at your, your LinkedIn profile. You're the person to ask about this. So we're going to be asking, or I'm going to be asking you some pretty dumb questions about how to run a real estate portal, if that's okay. Yeah. Fire away. Okay. Um, First question, just really easy off the bat. You, let's say you are made CEO of Real Estate Portal X. What do you do on your first day? Well, it, it, <laughs> it depends who the portal is. Is it a profitable portal? Is it a loss making portal? Is it number market leader? Is it what? So there's a bunch of sub subtext in that question. I think the, the core when you start to strip it all back is if you are a market leader, how do you defend and extend that position? Defend is make sure no one comes up behind you and, and, uh, and makes you number two. And in reality, that hasn't happened too often in this game around the world. I mean, Italy is the only, is, is, is probably the most classic of examples of where that's occurred, where it used to be Casa for it, um, for, uh, .it, who was the, uh, the market leader there, and that was you know, way back in two thousand and six, seven, eight, when uh, when uh, I was at the REA Group and we bought it from a guy called Antonio Frenian. And uh, clear market leader sort of lost its way, took the eye off the ball, didn't defend in that process, and allowed Immobiliare to come up, come in and uh, attack us as lunch. So the first thing is, if you're the market leader, you've got to defend and then extend. By extend, I mean how do you Think about growing the business from, you know, you're, you're driving a car in a race. You don't spend your time looking in the rear vision mirror at what's happening behind you. You look out the front and decide where you're going. And when you are extending, you know, the, the areas you need to focus are on pricing. Do you have any pricing elasticity and the capacity to put your prices up without losing your customers? Because that's the best way to make more money. Okay. okay. And then, and, and then, sorry, one, one other on. quick question. And and then, having done that, what are the easy products and services to then add into the mix, so that you can then capture more value from that current customer set? All right, I'm interested. So, getting back to the question of it's your first day, what do you do? The you know what you just said there makes sense. Do you say a version of that? Do you sit everybody down in a room? or send a big company email and give a version of that speech on your first day or no, no, you just you, you're, you're, the, and... your, your very first minute and, and, and it's sort of what if you if you're walking you know nothing about the business you shouldn't be walking in the door okay so let's assume you, you actually know <laughs> something about the business you're walking in to run um your 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 very first mission at literally that micro level is to is to confirm or dispel whatever hypotheses you've put in your head. And that's going to come from chatting to people, understanding what's really happening from it. Because you understand the outside in perspective. You're the market leader, you're an attacker in a market, whatever. But you want to make sure how it's viewed internally by going through and just sitting down one-on-ones with everyone. And you're going to use that real first week to just build relationships, under formalize your understanding of what is happening uh, in the business, um, truly happening in the business, understand whether the outside in perspective is equals to the inside out perspective. 
um, the, understand the gaps, and then start to identify the quick wins. What are the things that you could do differently? Put your price up as an example, right? That's about extending. Um, if, you're in a, if you're an attacker, what are some of the weak points of the, the market leader that you want to go after? Because you've got to focus. And what you're most likely to discover in these businesses is probably a lack of focus, like doing way too many things. Okay. Um, we'll, people aren't we'll aligned around that. what you're doing yeah. uh, we'll get in to the that. business and so on. I want to, so you talk about quick wins. I think one of the quick wins that any new CEO comes in and decides will be a quick win are operational expenses. So things like admin costs, employ, employment expenses, marketing, infrastructure, premises, this sort of thing, right? And I would imagine a new CEO comes in and looks at what they can cut. Would that be fair to say? That's like, that seems like a pretty standard no, thing to depends. do. It depends. Depends. If you're taking over a right move, you're not going to sit around thinking about cutting costs. If you're taking over someone who is bleeding a lot of money and you're being put in there because the new shareholders want to stem the flow. But it's very rarely that you have a business where you're going to cut your, cut your way to success. Okay? Just okay. cutting costs. Yeah, clearly if something is pure wastage, there's three people doing the job at one. Like, come on, you don't need three to do this job. Or they're doing something that you have to look at and you go, that just doesn't make sense. Or the process itself looks a little bit convoluted. Then you want to simplify. But often it's not to cut costs, it's to free up resources to do something more valuable. Right. And the most valuable thing to do in businesses is usually on the revenue generating side. The more revenue you got, the more oxygen you have, the more oxygen you have, the more chance you can make mistakes and recover from them. Okay. Okay. Staying just quickly um, with operational expenses, I think the reason that this whole idea um, came into my head, and there will be, by the way, there'll be an article that comes along with this podcast, is I was having a look at a company called Frontier Digital Ventures. For those who don't know, Frontier Digital Ventures, based in Malaysia, listed on the Australian Stock Exchange, runs real estate portals around the world. Um, in 2021, Frontier Digital Ventures bought a couple of companies in Latin America, and they said, um, basically, we're going to cut a load of costs around these two companies, these two businesses. I think they said something like, we're going to cut, uh, we're going to save 3 million Australian dollars over two years or whatever it was, right? Great. Um, well, not great. You know, when you cut costs, quite inevitably that means losing people, right? It's it's quite an onerous task cutting costs at these businesses. But you, you say, okay, we're going to gain 3 million from cutting these costs, right? And then I looked at their um, operational expenses breakdown and <laughs> some of quite a big chunk of what they saved by cutting these costs was wiped out by like foreign exchange um, changes, right? How frustrating has that got to be? for a CEO, like that would just keep me up at night. So angry. <laughs> would that be like, like how, how much can you actually control these operational expenses and how much no, yeah, effort yeah. should you put into it? Well, so the, the answer is you, you, first of all, it, 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 how, how you think about the problem and your temperament is quite critical in being successful. Um, you, you have to understand that the things that you cannot control. Okay. So you cannot control currency fluctuations between um, uh, the, the um, Brazilian real and the Australian dollar if you're reporting. So Frontier Digital Ventures reports in Australian dollars. Um, it's got operations in, in Latin America, so they're dealing with some sort of um, Latin American currency, and there will be fluctuations. Get over it. <laughs> you, can't, you can't do anything about that. Okay, so, so speak with us, then get over get over the little stuff. Get over but, the things you can't control. Well, no, you, you should only worry about what you know. You should focus on what you can control. So all your expense, you know, most of your expenses you can control. You can't control how much tax you pay to the government because that's a that's yeah. You know, there there is a, a formula there, right? And it's going to be tied down. You can manage it, but you can't control the actual end number. Um, and what you pay so so you focus on what you can control now you know in, in that example if you're running a, a a company in in chile right which they do okay and you're paying your employees in local currency and you're earning local currency 
the currency fluctuations are actually quite irrelevant. Okay. What matters is because if you're reporting, no one in Brazil is being paid with Australian dollars and no one in Brazil as your customer base is paying you in Australian dollars. It just happens to be the currency you report in. Therefore, focus on what you can control now in, 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 and I don't know the details, but I'd say in that circumstance is, okay, we've got X number of employees, we've got Y amount of, uh, you know, and, and sorry, and costs, and employees are generally the most, the, the largest chunk of those costs. And I've got this many um, uh, m amount of revenue being generated. What you do is you fundamentally go through and say, well, either it's one product only I'm selling or I'm selling multiple products. What's the profitability of each product and allocate people you know, who are working on the products and selling the products and maintaining the products and building the products. And you'll pretty much work out quite quickly that some products are very profitable and that's usually a small group of very profitable products and a large group of very non-profitable products. And a lot of companies you know, form the belief, sometimes mistakenly, that they can build new products and grow their way out of a problem. Now, what happens is, yes, I'm earning $10, but I've just spent $30 to earn the $10. And unless I have very high levels of confidence that that $10 is going to go to $50 and I can keep the $30 at $30, um, I may you know, suddenly cut some of those um, new products. And then what that means is I may lose some revenue, but I also lose you know, the, the, the associated cost with that revenue. But overall, I've become more profitable. Okay, I want to move on. I want to talk about traffic. Um, I or we at Online Marketplaces have written a lot about traffic recently because of CoStar and what's going on in the US. Um, is it a vanity metric? So we're talking a lot about traffic, but um, I mean, traffic doesn't pay the bills, right? Um, if you were coming into a new real estate portal, would you be telling everybody, right, we've, we've got to focus on traffic, we've got to grow the traffic? If so, would it be mainly for PR purposes, as we're seeing in America? Or is it actually like, no, 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 if we grow traffic, the revenue will inevitably follow? Yeah, no, it's, it's certainly not a vanity metric. Um, but you have to think about it a little bit more deeply. So um, if if the way you demonstrate value as a um, marketplace or a portal to your advertisers is through leads. Um, one thing is absolutely sure, if you have zero traffic, you will have zero leads. And if you have zero leads, no one will want to actually spend any money with you advertising. Okay, that's, that's just without debate. So then you go, okay, how do I generate leads? Now, in a very, in an unsophisticated model, it's just about I throw as much traffic as possible with the problem and hopefully within that traffic are people who want to buy a property or rent a property and they'll generate a lead. The more leads that I send to my advertisers, the happier they are, the happier they are, the more they're likely to pay me. The more they pay me, the more I can then reinvest in driving traffic and so on. That's the very much just throw throw as much as possible at the problem and, and, and yeah, hope it all works. The next level of sophistication, which is below, and that's just a straight traffic number, okay? Because remember, a lot of those traffic metrics are all about saying, I'm the biggest, you're an advertiser, so you better advertise with me because I've got the audience. I'm the place where people are looking. So if you're not advertising with me, you're not being seen by the audience. Okay, so there is a PR um, benefit. Oh, absolutely. No. But there's also a real benefit. The real benefit is who's paying you money? Well, the agent is paying me money. I've got to deliver them leads. So if I'm not delivering the leads now, you've then got to get now the next level of sophistication is okay. Let's assume that's not about just a sheer volume. I pour in a million at one end to get 10 leads at the other. I now actually want to be able to pour in a million at one end, but get 50 at the other. So I'm now going to get more efficient, more effective in how I, put things in front of front of people, give them more choices to click, give them a way in which they can interact with me better so that I can then generate more leads. Now then you take, so that's then 
how do I get more leads from the same volume of traffic? That's the next level of sophistication. And there's a lot of regenerating of leads, uh, repurposing of leads. Someone applied to one house, the agent didn't respond within um, uh, 24 hours or 12 hours or five hours or pick a number. Therefore, I'm going to take that lead because I know what the person's interested in is a three bedroom, two bathroom apartment in a suburb, and I'm going to send it to other agents with properties in that okay. suburb, right? So there's about lead repurposing. That's how you get more from the same. And then, and the agents love that because they're met. One of their vanity metrics is how many leads did I get from Portal X? Okay. And that justifies value. Then the next level down is to say, I'm actually going to send you less leads, but of a much higher quality. So instead of I'm sending you 50 leads a month, I'm going to send you 20 leads a month, but those 20 leads a month have got a 10 times more chance of closing. Right. So it's like me sending you 200 historically. So, and that's where portals try to get to. Now, the problem with that is that your customer has to be, um, has to understand that you're going to send you less, but at a higher quality. And if all they're looking at is counting how many did I get, then you've wasted your time. I guess another problem with that potentially as well is if you, as the marketplace, are saying to your customer, we will give you higher quality leads, firstly, how are you measuring it? How are you defining that? And secondly, the way you're probably doing that is you are taking more data from that person who's interested in the house. And yes. if you're taking more data from that person who's interested in the house, you control more of the data in the whole relationship and your customers might get a bit annoyed about that. I think that's what, what's happening a bit in, in the US with um, Showing Time Plus being... Um, owned by Zillow, for example. Yeah, I think, well, it's, there's, a, there's always a fine line around this. I can send you 50 leads, there you go. Ed, here's your 50 leads. And you go, great, I've got 50 people I've got to call. I don't know if they're just, if they're, if they're like, a, a, like someone I should be calling or someone who just happened to be interested in, and clicked on that because I wanted to see three new pictures for no other reason than they're trying to renovate their bathroom and they wanted a different angle. Well, I don't want to waste my time on the second. I want to invest my time on the first. Um, the way you, at, you know, do lead attribution, you, you add more value to a lead is by what I do. So what are the other properties I've looked at, how long I've spent on the site and so on. So that helps you grade the lead quality. It's, it's what I tell you about me. So ask me some questions. Hey, thanks for inquiring about this house. Um, are you ready to buy now? Do you have a mortgage? Do you, do you need to borrow money and so on? Why? Because we want to make sure we want to give you the best service. Okay. All automated, of course, using AI. And the third is what is what I can find out about you. Well, I know that you know, you've, you've given me details about LinkedIn or whatever. I can see you've just got a new job or I've, you, know, you, you might give me details on Facebook and so on. So it's about how much information I can then put around you, Ed, as a buyer to send to the real estate agent in a way that allows them to do their job better. And then the question is, well, do they get worried that their job is being um, taken over by the portal? I think the smart ones don't. The smart ones are going, you, you mean I can do more sales per month and thus put more money in my pocket because you're going to do a bunch of the, the grunt work for me? Yeah, give me those leads all day, every day. And by okay. the way, I'm happy to to uh, pay more for those leads because I know that I'm closing out twice as many deals from leads from you. So I'm happy to pay yeah, 50% more. Okay, here's an interesting question for you. Um, you, re you raise an interesting point there, right? Um, for a real estate portal's business model to work, you kind of, to an extent, you do have to explain something like that to the agents, right? You do have to say to them, listen, we're not trying to take your business. We're trying to give you more business, right? To what extent do you, let's go back to our example, you're made CEO of Portal X in country Y, right? To what extent do you personally get involved with the PR efforts or the outreach to talk to agents? Because we've seen, I always use this as an example, on the market in the UK, 
um, their CEO, Jason Teb, former agent himself, he's everywhere. He's always talking to agents in person, explaining things, right? And I, I mean, from the outside, it seems to be working. To what extent would you, Simon Baker, be, you know, front and center of the PR drive to educate agents? Um, would I be front and center? I think there's, there's, there's two, two, two ways to think about this. One is you need to talk to your customers. You need to meet with your customers. You need to get out of the office, go in the car, have face-to-face -face meetings. And I've done hundreds over the years from develop from big agents, big franchise groups, developers, right through to, you know, the small mom and pop agency. Cause if you don't have a feeling for your customer base, you're never going to sell them the right product. Yeah. And you're selling to people, people, if you're in the real estate agency business, you're a people person, right? You're sales so people you... selling to sales people. Yeah. Because the one thing that everyone forgets a property portal and a real estate agents, we're just intermediaries. We exi if we don't deliver value in the process, then we've got a problem. We are not the, we're not the, the manufacturer of the product and we're not the buyer of the product or service. We are just part of the chain that matches a buyer with a seller or a renter with a landlord. That's all we are. So if you're not adding value in that process and dealing with your upstream customer and your downstream customer and giving them the best quality service, then you've, you've, you've lost the point. And you can only do that by actually spending time with them. So okay. assuming you do that. And then the question is the, the, the reality is that the industry is always paranoid that you're going to take their lunch, eat it and leave them with a crust. Okay. And they've, I, I've got doc documents showing the vitriol of, a, of an Australian uh, franchise group sending to all its members, blood dripping down a page, the death of our industry. Don't advertise with realestate.com.au, um, which I actually will, will, um, I can actually dig up in, in a few weeks and because it's not here um, and I, <laughs> and I will share it on, on social media Please and do. it's fun, fun, right? Because that's how they used to think about it. All you're going to do is replace us and take any So, I mean, the cold hard reality is no one who runs a portal wants to become a real estate agent unless they have to. Okay. And in, 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 in established markets like uh, Europe, Australia, you know, the, 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 um, they, they don't want to because you can make a lot more money. I mean, do you think Rightmove wants to become a real estate agent? It makes no sense. They're sitting on a 75% EBITDA margin. They're already capturing about 10% of the commission an agent earns anyway. And they're going to do, you know, basically minimal work. What a okay, great job to you, have. Back to the question, would you, Simon Baker, personally go around to these agents and sit in their offices or whatever, or would you, you know, would you of course. have other people do that? Yeah. Of course. Okay. Bloody hell. If you, if you, if you, if you're a, a CEO sits in an ivory tower and doesn't get out, then you're just, you know, it's just a matter of time before you know that no longer there because okay, you're disconnected from your, from your audience. We'll move on. We'll move on. Um, another kind of lever that I, I guess, think about if we have this scenario of being made CEO of real estate portal X is unit economics, which I guess is another way of saying uh, price increases, right? How often, how much can you realistically up the price? And, you know, does it really make its way to the bottom line? How do you think about price rises? We actually, we did talk about this a little bit with um, Georg Schmiel uh, a few weeks ago. He had some interesting thoughts. I just, uh, I wanted to get your quick thoughts on it. Yeah, absolutely. If, if, if I can put the price up, I'll put the price up tomorrow. I think everyone is too cute, too nervous, too socialistic some days in their views on it. Now, the answer is if a real estate agent's making money in this case from the leads that you're generating, let's say you're a portal in a market and you're generating 40% of the leads that they're closing out and they're paying you on a per lead basis equivalent to 2% of the commission they're receiving or 5%, 3%. And you go, well, I'll turn those leads off. Are they going to go, that's okay. No, they're going to go, why? Because I'm making, because they're made for their investment. So put yourself in their shoes, right? Their return on investment. Okay. Is if they're, if they're, if they're spending 5% um, of their commission 
to earn a, of, of, on the sale of a property on the marketing to get the leads that close, they're making 20 times return on their investment in marketing. Wait a second, they're making 20 times the return? And we're nervous of putting that price up 20%? Oh, wait, so they're going to make 18 times their return. Yeah, this is, on. one of the th this is one of the kind of um, questions on my sheet here that isn't really a question. This is the one thing I would be sure about if I were made a real estate portal CEO. Like I said, I've been doing this, covering this industry for four years, and there is definitely a pattern where, you know, it doesn't matter the country, it doesn't matter the situation. You always get these stories of, Real Estate Portal X puts their prices up, agents are unhappy. And then do you hear any more about it? Uh, no. Agents, agents are going to be unhappy about any price increase for eternity. Yet they're driving around a Mercedes, they're driving around a whole bunch yeah. of other stuff that per month will probably cost more than they're spending on their advertising. It's, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's you, you can't confuse um, action with motion. Action, noise, I'm scared you, you'd be a screw in my industry and motion i'm no longer going to actually spend money on you i've cancelled my contract okay yeah and the, the most classic case of this happened in 2000 and oh, it's 20 years ago now so there you go and it was when um emo scout 24 was selling itself no they're preparing to list for the, no there's something like the founders of scout emo scout 24 in germany way back it must be 2003 four five somewhere around that that that, that date were coming, were selling their business and they had an earn out. Now I can't remember, I think they were selling it to private equity. Um, and the earn out, they basically were coming up to their earn out and they said, right, we need to maximize our earn out, which was a, which is an EBITDA multiple, if I remember correctly. And what we're going to do is we're going to double the amount to, that it costs to advertise on us. We're going from like a hundred to 200 euros, nothing, nothing material, right? They literally, they decided on Friday and they doubled it on Monday. Okay. Double, a hundred percent increase in price. They lost twenty five percent of their customers. Remember, if you lose, if you double and you lose fifty percent of your customers, you stay in the same place. If you double and you lose twenty five percent of your customers, you're ahead, materially ahead. Over three months, they got eighty percent of the twenty five percent back. So after three months, they doubled their price. And they had lost maybe five percent of their customers. Yeah, definitely so, less. So, what's that telling you in that? A, noise, the action, blah, the end of the world, motion, nothing changed. Okay, and most people are so worried about the noise that they then don't do the action, right? Which is double the price. And I think you, you, or, or, or price increase, I should say. So you. You, you've got to be very clear on the value you're creating, why it makes sense to put your prices up, the part of the value you're taking, right? what's the overall P&L of your customer. We used, I used to get my team to say, give me the average real estate agent's P&L. Show me revenue, number of sales, times commission, less all these expenses. Great. I want to know what they are really making. I want to know what they're spending. Oh, they're renting a, they're, they're, they're renting Mercedes. They're resenting it because they've got to have the nice looking this and the nice looking office because it's all about projecting an image. Okay. I'm going, well, what do they cost? What do they cost? Okay. So if they don't have the car, does that mean they don't have as many sales? Clearly not. Okay. If you don't have the leads from us, does it mean they don't have the sales? Absolutely. So why are they spending that on the car and not on us? That's good. I like that. That's a, that's a nice little lesson <laughs> for people out there. It's also a nice clip that we'll use to promote this episode. Maybe get some agents riled up a little bit. <laughs> well, <laughs> we'll it's, it's common sense. I mean, no, you're right. I mean, it is common sense and it's the smart know, agents just run naive it, not run. to think of it like that, I guess, isn't yeah. it? The smart agents just run their business and they go, where's my cheapest source of leads that convert at the highest rates. And I'm going to buy as many of those leads as possible. And I want those leads to come to me and not to my competitor. So the debate I have is not about how much I'm spending with a portal, because that's the wrong conversation. The right conversation is how do I make sure I am capturing more leads than my competitor from that portal? 
And it means I've got to spend a bit extra, which means my competitor down the road is not getting the listing. Then I'm going to do that. Okay. Don't get caught up in the small game. Play the real game, the big game. And the job of the portal or the marketplace is to communicate the value they're creating because you've always got to communicate the value you're creating, not just at the moment of sale, but then ongoing. This is not only did you make the right decision in buying this car, okay, at the moment of buying the car, but boy, you've bought the best car on the planet. That's what BMW focus on, the ultimate driving machine. Half their advertisements are not targeting the people who are going to buy a BMW. They're driving, they're targeting the people who have bought the BMW so they feel really good about the, that decision. So when they come to buy the next car, they go, I'm not, I've got to start with BMW. Why would I go and look at a Mercedes? Okay, fair enough. We'll move on. Um, you mentioned it earlier, diversification, moving into different revenue streams. I'm interested if you have like a set of like very rigid criteria for when to diversify or if it's a case by case thing, if it's like, right, if, if this metric is X, if this metric is Y, if our market research says this, then we will diversify no matter what, or is it case by case, uh, you know, how would you think about it? Yeah. So, so business is not a scientific formula, right? And, and anyone who thinks it is, 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 is going down the, the wrong approach. You, if, First of all, if you're going to diversify, the question is, what does diversify mean? So usually mortgages for most portals, uh, right? Yeah. So, so, but there's if so, let's say the core business, the super core business, is getting a, agents or developers to put their listings onto a website. Okay. Now then, and and them paying to do that, and you driving traffic there, and they get leads, and everyone's sort of happy. Okay. The next level of diversification is saying, well, I'll tell you what you can spend more money and go to the top of the search, right? And so on. That's the next layer of diversification. Mm. You can put your advertisements around the outside, you can do all that sort of stuff. And getting smart about how you put that all together and how you price it, being differentiating in your pricing. You know, this suburb over here should be paying more than that suburb over there because the average house sale, is, you know, different commissions, different house prices, different volumes, right? So. They're all diversifications from the very, very core business. Then you start to go broader and broader and broader and you get to like a mortgages or a CRM business or whatever. First of all, most of those fail, right? And they fail because the people who are building in the inside think they can build the next level. And, and, and the expensive lessons you learned is if you're really good at one thing, Keep doing that one thing until you've sucked every ounce of life out of it and then keep going, okay? Because going and doing the next thing organically is probably going to fail. And it's probably going to fail because it's just a different cup of tea, right? You just don't know how to – you, you think you know how to do it because you've got someone sat down and did a nice little PowerPoint presentation and that sort of sounds like nice and easy with some diagrams, but – Execution is really hard. If you are going to go into those areas, acquire, spend the money, buy the expertise, buy the knowledge, buy the customer base, buy the learning, the experience, and make sure you then get out of the way and just provide as much rocket fuel to make it work. Yeah. Okay. Thinking about mortgages specifically, um, I was just thinking in my head then, I can't think of a single real estate portal mortgage business that has been really, really successful at doing it organically. Can you? You probably know more than no. I do. No, in fact, I'll give you a great, a great example. Two thousand and five, maybe six, we did real estate home loans, REA home loans. It was cool. We did it as a joint venture. We started from scratch. We hired the first guy. His name I can't remember. We did it as a joint venture with uh, Ray White, um, their mortgage business. And we closed it down after about 18 months because we just couldn't get the, the, we didn't close that. We ended up just selling it to Ray White. They bought the, the book, the mortgage book and, and, and we, we and took over the customer relationships and we sailed off into the sunset. 
Then, yeah, domain, uh, just, domain just shut theirs down, I think. Yeah, but that but this is two things. Yes, I mean, one thing is the same thing's played out again. You know, people haven't learned. Oh, yeah, but this is 2006, I think, or seven. Then REA did it again. I think they even called it REA Home Loans again with the same outcome seven or eight years later because there was no corporate memory. Okay. Eventually, the third time round, they bought a business. Okay, and then having bought the business, they bought you know, the knowledge and experience and so on. But then you go look at the numbers. It's not like it's you know, challenging their core business. Remember, put your price up 10%. If you're earning 500 million revenues, put your price up 10%. That's another 50 million. You've got to do a lot of work at selling mortgages to get the same outcome. Oh, and by the way, to your earlier question, that price increase goes straight to the bottom line. Well, you're not right. going to run your mortgage. You know, A, you're not yeah. going to get to 50 million mortgage revenue and it'd be 100% EBITDA margin. That doesn't happen. Okay. So, so you, 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 but it feels sexy and exciting and let's go and do it and we can do this because we're amazingly wonderful. And so many, so many marketplaces think about it that way. Whereas the, 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 the way I think about it is what is the total value of commissions for either new home sales or established home sales in a market. What is a fair and reasonable percentage of that revenue to be coming to me as the marketplace for generating, for helping you know the agents and developers generate that outcome? Right. I just want to focus on getting that. Now, you'll go through waves of easy to get, and it's going to be hard to get, but you're going to capture more and more value. Because remember, it's the same customers. You're just getting to write a bigger check. Okay, we'll move on to our last kind of, I guess, lever that a real estate portal CEO can pull. Although in this case, I'm not sure if they can pull it or not. I'm talking about market dynamics. Now, I think probably the biggest lesson for me, having done this for four years, is real estate portals all look the same all over the world. Uh, I can definitely confirm that one. They all essentially do the same thing. You know, they're helping somebody to find their new home, but they are all very different under the hood, right? They all, they're all subject to the market dynamics of the place that they, they're in. I'm interested in, can a real estate portal actually change market dynamics? So I'll give you an example of a real estate portal trying to change market dynamics. Um, Daft, is the biggest real estate portal in Ireland, and they are trying to do vendor paid advertising. If anyone doesn't know what vendor paid advertising is, check out uh, an episode we did. One of the earliest episodes we did was on vendor paid advertising, very interesting. The point here is a real estate portal is trying to change how the property market works in their market. Is this something that you think, if you are a powerful portal, you are the CEO of a powerful portal, do you think you can change market dynamics to your benefit? So, so let's think about market dynamics in two dimensions. One is like the macroeconomic environment. Talk to Zameen, talk to Shui Property in Myanmar. The answer is you cannot change the macro environment. You've either got government coups, you've got a whole range of stuff that is just literally out of your control and you have to operate in that environment. So don't push against it, ride the wave and maximize the outcome. The second you're talking about is sort of the, the dynamics on how the market works within that macroeconomic environment, okay? Um, and the answer is that's very hard because if you want to go from an environment where take, um, uh, there's, there's, two, there's two sort of really good issues, vendor paid advertising, who pays for the advertising? The second is the type of model. Yeah, you know, instead of selling houses by here's the price and, and give me an offer, uh, we'll do an auction, okay? So you're changing the way in which people buy and sell property, okay? And who advertises. It's very hard to change decades of, of experience and decades of ingraining because you're basically saying to people, you know the way you used to sell your property? Well, you're going to do it differently. You're going to turn up to an auction on a weekend and you're going to buy your property. But that's what, that's distressed property, right? as the ones you can't sell through any other mechanism you put to an auction. Well, yes, if you're in Europe and no, if you're in Australia, it's the way you sell property. Same with vendor paid advertising. 
if if forever and a day there's an expectation that the agent's going to spend the money to promote the property, and then they go, you know what, you're still going to pay me my 3% commission or my 2% commission, but I also want you, on top of that, to spend the advertising dollar. I'd be going, why am I doing that? I'll pay you 1% then. And they go, no, 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 no. I don't want my commission played with, okay, because it, because then it just becomes a flow through in terms of the, 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 the advertising dollar because they'll always believe that they can do a better job with that marketing dollar than if you just send it straight to a portal. So I think changing those market dynamics is very, very hard and one that I would um, not try to do. I would try to actually ride the wave and ride the wave better than my competitor. Yeah, I can't think of any examples apart from maybe that daft one, which is ongoing and we kind of wait and see whether they can do it or not. I'm trying to think of any other examples where a real estate portal has tried to change how market dynamics work. Yeah, so there are, there's, there's, there's a couple. So right move did it in the United Kingdom. So remember in the United Kingdom, commission rates are around 1%, maybe a bit more, one, one, one and a quarter maybe. And years ago, and I'm maybe 20 now, no, a bit, a bit less, 18 years ago, um, maybe less, 16, 16, 15 years ago. What they did was they allowed consumers to go onto the website and claim their own property. So Ed, you're selling your house in the Isle of Wight and they, and you, you go, okay, um, uh, it's on the website being sold by uh, Buxton's, or I don't know, Buxton's, that's wrong, wrong country. Um, and, and you see it there and you go, oh, well, there's what's this? Oh, claim my house. I'm going to click on this. You know, so for only you know, an extra 150 pounds, you can put it to the top of the search. Now they worked on the theory that you, Ed, were more in, more um, engaged with where your house was being listed than the agent was, and the agent didn't want to spend the extra 150 200 pounds from their pocket to make you the top of the search, but you would. And by the way, if you um, order it. And you put it through the agent, so the agent then, you know, adds to their bill, um, which you can, which they can then negotiate with you. Um, then it'd be twenty five percent off, or some some discount off that rate. Right. Failed. Okay. Because you're trying to change the culture of an environment. I think actually, having just thought about it, I think there is another example of real estate portals, plural in this case, trying to change the market dynamics, and that's what's happening in the US now with. Um, what was it called? Listing Showcase by Zillow. I think Realtors got Realtors.com's got a similar thing. And obviously, CoStar, you're listing your lead, right? They're trying to say to real estate agents in the US, no, 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 you don't list for free anymore, or you can list for free, but actually, we want you to pay to gain extra visibility. Um, and I think there's still kind of a question mark over whether it's going to work. And I think it'd be very interesting. Certainly to see how homes.com does it, because that's the only way they're monetizing at the moment. And it's, but I don't, not but don't they really, they're not really, they used to. but they're not changing culture. They're not asking the, the home seller to pay more money. They just got, they're just finding a different way to extract money from the agent's pocket. At the end of the day, that's what it all is. Okay. Who's going to pay? The agent's going to pay. The agent's going to pay for different visibility or a different outcome or a perceived better outcome. But remember, the agent's already paying to put their houses, they're already paying a fee to the MLS, they're already paying an advertising fee. You know, there'll be a whole bunch of fees in that, that annual fee that they pay to the MLS. And this is just a way in which Zillow and, 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 and Co are just trying to get a bit more money out of their pocket. So I, I don't think it's a true change of behavior okay. or dynamics. All right, so I'm, we're about to hit 45 minutes. Um, I'm going to ask you a horrible question. I'm going to ask you to put your hand in the fire. What is the most important factor if you are just a new person coming into running a real estate portal? Is it traffic? Is it hiring the right people? Is it um, uh, pricing? What is it? You are on the spot. What's the most important factor here? Absolute clarity on what you're going to do. What is the direction you're going in? Make sure then... And, and why it's valuable, okay? Um, 
getting everyone to buy into that and then executing it without missing a beat. So whatever that strategy is, and it can be different strategies, right? You got to have because the, they'll be based on the market dynamics and the things that are, uh, are are relevant in that market. It's where you lose people is where you're not clear and succinct and to the point. And you and I and I absolutely remember very vividly back in the day. I'm talking 2002, so you know, 20 bloody two years ago. Right? And and I remember sitting there and we're going, we're, we're, we're building REA and we're, we're realestate.com.au and we're getting traction, we're getting agents to sign up. And, of course, people in the team come up with these wonderful ideas. Why don't we do this? Why don't we do that? You know, and the, the next bright, shiny bauble that's over there, the, the shiny lights. And I, and I remember thinking, oh, that's interesting. And then I'd have to halt, catch myself and say, no. We're going to do what we did yesterday. We're going to do it again today. We're going to do it tomorrow. We're going to do it for the next year. We're just going to sign up agents, put our prices up, send them more leads, keep demonstrating value, make us as uh, make us the oxygen to their business, and then we can worry about all that stuff later. Because the maths was clear. The maths was well. If I get you Ed to pay an extra fifty dollars for the same service. Where's the 50 going to the bottom line? So, okay. So, so we're saying clarity and strategy. Okay. Focus, focus, focus. All right. We'll leave it there. Simon, thank you very much for your time. I now, I say, I, maybe I feel 10% more confident in my abilities as a, a real estate portal <laughs> CEO. Not that Great. anyone's going to give Let's me that job. find you a portal to run. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Someone's just got to give me the job. All yeah. right. Thank you. Thanks, and uh, Yeah. Talk again soon. Thanks.